No comment about uh, Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so again, my name is Delia Vasquez, uh, PhD student in the History of Consciousness Department at University of California at Santa Cruz, also a member of um, the University of California Graduate Student Union, UAW 2865. Uh, yeah, right on. Um, and yeah, so talking about the founder of the Black Panther Party, Huey P. Newton, and his late theorizations, particularly that of intercommunalism. Uh, so uh, this talk um, will have um, kind of two main parts. Uh, the first section goes through his theorizations, um, its economic aspects, some of its philosophical aspects, theoretical aspects, and then later how the Black Panther Party applied that thought um, uh, politically in practice and also any kind of relations to contemporary struggles. Uh, mm, uh, so I apologize for not having much in terms of visuals or PowerPoint. Uh, so I ask that you please um, uh, raise your hand, interrupt me if necessary to ask for clarification, um, particularly through some of the denser stuff, but I'll try really hard to, to make it um, you know, legible. Um, and I'm really eager to, to engage with whatever questions people have. Uh, as people probably more or less know, the Black Panther Party was the last and perhaps most significant domestically based uh, left revolutionary political organization to challenge the United States in the 20th century. Uh, uh, at its height, the Black Panther Party encompassed 68 chapters in the United States, and it, and it established an international branch in Algeria and trained with operatives in the Congo, and also formed coalitions with or political organizations in uh, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, South Africa, North and South Vietnam, North Korea, the People's Republic of China, Uruguay, Nicaragua, Cuba, Palestine, Iraq, Israel, and throughout Europe, especially Northern Europe. Uh, a lot of people aren't as aware that the Black Panther Party went through a series of political and ideological shifts very quickly during their history, which I've suggested an outline of up here. And uh, really, it was in part in response to a backlash within the black community to the Black Panther Party's position of internationalism that Huey Newton then uh, started working on this theory of intercommunalism. <clears throat> uh, so, so, yeah. So on, uh, on November uh, 18th, 1970, uh, Huey Newton introduced his theory of uh, revolutionary intercommunalism to an audience at Boston College later in February of 71, he expanded on this theory during a joint talk that he gave at Yale with psychologist Eric Erickson across several days and then later in Oakland. His opening remarks lasted about an hour but were, re were reduced to about 10 pages in sub subsequent publications. Um, as a philosophical foundation for those remarks on intercommunalism, he, his introductory speech included an engagement with the work of Hegel, Marx, Freud, Jung, Kant, uh, Pierce, and William James, among others. Uh, so really, much of the, his theorizations have been kind of lost to posterity. Um, uh, last summer, in conjunction with a class that I was teaching at, at uh, UC Santa Cruz, I went to the archives at Sanford where a lot of his papers from when he was doing his doctorate um, uh, are still, and kind of dug out some of his writings, kind of pieced them together. So that, um, a lot of this paper is based off of an analysis of a text that he wrote in 1974 on intercommunalism. And uh, soon, uh, Viewpoint magazine, uh, with which some of you may be familiar, will be putting out that text, as well as my accompanying analysis, and also um, uh, Assad Hader's uh, political, political critique of uh, the Black Panther movie. Uh, maybe some other materials also. So, uh, all right. So, uh, so, Hugh Newton was, uh, in 1970, released from prison after the Free Huey campaign. Uh, and, one, and one of the first, or the first thing that he did uh, upon being released was to pledge troops to um, uh, Vietnam uh, against the U.S. military, pledged uh, like the Black Panther Party uh, in the form of troops. And uh, yeah, like I said, uh, there was an immediate kind of backlash from the black community in response to that. 
Many simply could not grasp what the liberation of black people could possibly, ha possibly have to do with the Vietnamese communists against whom the U.S. Was, was waging war. The theory of intercommunalism was Newton's attempt to lay out a political and economic account of how he, he understood the world to be structured at the time under a new type of imperialism, um, but it was also his attempt at forming a political strategy for how the Black Panther Party could expect to move forward in the decades to come, given those conditions. So uh, he wrote that in 1970, and then later expanded on those theorizations in the late 70s while completing his doctorate uh, in the history of consciousness at UC Santa Cruz, uh, which is an interdisciplinary, mixed discipline department uh, for the study of philosophy, cultural theory, political theory. From 72 through 80, Newton worked on a wide range of theoretical problems, uh, including a series of studies into the global decentralization of production and the feasibility of revolutionary expropriations uh, in a text called The Technology Question and other related texts. He accumulated writings and annotations on anthropology, evolutionary biology, and human psychology for a proposed book on deceit and self-deception that uh, was never published, though he did publish a related article later in 1982 with evolutionary biologist Dr. Robert Trivers for Science Digest. Uh, that's available. You can look that up. Uh, among his most philosophical writings, though, are included uh, well, a lot of things. A metaphysical inquiry into the possibility of a utopian politics, uh, drawing from dial uh, from uh, dialectical materialism, psychoanalysis, and his theory of intercommunalism, an essay on the earliest political struggles over the constitution of gender in Eve, the mother of all living, and also a sprawling engagement with mind-body dualism in the text, uh, The Mind is Flesh. He also uh, did a, a critique of theological approaches to history through a reading of the Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, materialist historicization of early Christian history, presumably for use with the Black Panther Party's late um, black community-oriented son of man, temple, and church, and a bunch of other writings. So you, you get the idea, right? Um, uh, it's worth noting, of course, that um, you know, increasingly contemporary depictions of Huey Newton depict him as um, uh, not an intellectual. In, in the movie uh, The Vanguard that came out what, two, three years ago, he was actually called a thug. Right? Uh, uh, now, uh, Newton was Ill illiterate until 17 or so, at which point he taught himself to read by uh, reading poetry and memorizing, or reading Plato's Republic seven times consecutively. Um, uh, he never tested, or rarely tested, to an IQ above 74, which would locate him as uh, borderline mentally deficient, but... Uh, the second, time, the second set of times that he was tested, uh, he intentionally uh, chose to uh, not take the test seriously, if you will, you know, as a critique of the race, racist aspects of these kinds of tests. Um, all right, anyways, so that's just kind of background on how to understand even where he's coming from here. So reactionary intercommunalism, and here I'm quoting from his writing. We see then that the United States controls other countries thousands of miles away, and uses their resources to benefit the ruling circle in America. The same situation holds for the many communities of the oppressed within the United States. Therefore, the evidence shows very clearly that the United States is not a nation, for its boundaries have extended into every territory of the world. The United States is an empire. So Newton's theory of intercommunalism seeks to provide an explanation for the dominating and ultimately determining political force of American capitalist empire on the world stage uh, as of the 70s when he wrote it, as well as the corresponding decline of, uh, and political influence of nation states and the deterioration of any positive political potential for nationalism. He refers to this condition and phase of capitalism as reactionary intercommunalism. According to Newton in 1970, nation states can no longer be meaningfully said to exist Instead, global capital has, through U.S. empire in particular, reduced the world to a collection of communities that lack control over their local conditions of life and which can, at most, only become autonomous or independent liberated territories within the larger empire. Uh, these communities can, uh, however, by seizing the material structures that allow for production, technology, and information media, fight to build an interconnected and collective relationship among themselves in a global dynamic that he calls revolutionary intercommunalism. Uh, 
Elaine Brown, uh, chair of the party between 74 and 77, has pointed out that uh, in many ways this theory approximates notions of globalization that were developed later. Uh, the theory of intercommunalism as a whole is an attempt to describe uh, how global revolutionary change might be expected to unfold given these conditions of globalization and also to prescribe how uh, revolutionary actors might go about playing an agential role. Uh, quote of Newton's, the concept of intercommunalism not only accurately describes and defines the situation, it also implies our obligation to unify and share with these dispersed communities the wealth that has been stolen from them and centralized here in the United States. Uh, during the particular turning point in the history of the Black Panther Party when he developed the theory, uh, he was also concerned with how black people in particular might attain liberation without relying on a state that purports to represent them as a people or nation. Uh, according to Noon, any efforts by black people to gain national sovereignty or independence while global capitalism still exists could only lead to alternate forms of subjugation under American empire. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so the text begins with um, him kind of laying out and arguing that as capitalist competition inevitably tends towards monopoly capitalism and the consolidation of power in the hands of a few, it expands in reach from the domestic to the global in the form of imperialism. Noon is concerned with theorizing a form of imperialism which is increasingly tied less to the interests of the nation state that deploys the military abroad than to the interests of the businesses that benefit from the deployment of that military. He quotes uh, Woodrow, Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson in 1907, uh, quote, since trade ignores national boundaries and the manufacturer insists on having the world as a market, the flag of his nation must follow him and the doors of the nations which are closed must be battered down. So that's the president's words uh, directly. Uh, so like I said, not um, very few have engaged with um, Newton's theory really at all, though there is one text that engages with some of these economic issues in particular, uh, actually published just last fall, by John Narayan, I hope I'm, I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Um, that text is called uh, Newton's Intercommunalism and Unacknowledged Theory of Empire. In it, um, I'll kind of point to three things that he does in particular. He analyzes the relationship between Newton's theory and those of um, Michael Hart and Antonio Negri. Uh, he uh, also draws a, uh, well, analyzes the relationship between Newton's theory and Emmanuel Wallerstein's uh, conception of kind of similar dynamics uh, in 74, and also um, points out that Newton indeed seems to accurately um, identify the, what would come to be the future rise of nationalisms without a nation state, particularly for the white working class. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Newton continues then to argue about the uh, ideological relationship between U.S.-based corporations and the overseas military activity of the United States. Uh, he says that we can even refer to this army, the U.S. Army, I'm quoting from him, as the intercommunal police force. They control communities they do not live in and have no interest in, and they are controlled by the ruling clique for the purposes of profit and personal and military might. Um, indeed, to that point, in 1950, as justification for entering Korea, the United States executive branch under President Truman first started using the term police action to refer to military actions pursued without a formal constitutional congressional dec declaration of war. Okay. Um, however, the political economic dynamics that define reactionary intercommunalism also create the conditions for revolutionary possibility. Uh, more specifically, as more and more of the daily efforts of the global poor are dictated by a smaller set of corporations and states, more of the global population is brought together by their shared relationship to those workplaces and the technologies that hold them together. Quote, the centralization of production produces the socialization of production, the development of an increasingly interdependent and co pro cooperative basis of social labor. So this interdependence and connectedness creates the conditions for a greater shared lived experience and therefore a greater possible level of solidarity among the employed, unemployed, and underemployed of the world. For Newton, an awareness of this uh, political possibility 
followed from his philosophical grounding in dialectical materialism. All right, so the economics part is done for those struggling with that part. I know I struggle with it. Uh, so, so can I have a show of hands of people that um, feel like they have a solid grasp or awareness of dialectical materialism? <laughs> right, right, right. Okay. So. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah it's, it's worth noting that. Uh, so yeah, Newton, you know, produced this theory and tried to, uh, of course, um, propagate it throughout the party and among comrades. But it was very difficult to grasp for for most. Um, ultimately, actually, uh, the party established an, uh, a school, the, their first school, the Ideological Institute uh, of Intercommunalism. Uh, uh, which was composed of basically a bunch of um, like street kids, lumpen, um, that they recruited and tried to teach mathematics, philosophy, and this stuff. And it, it, didn't, it didn't go so well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, I'll, I'll try to do a better job, but, you know, yeah. Consistent with the ancient Greek approach, according to which philosophy is pursued always for a practical purpose, to understand better how to live the good life, for Newton, no ethical, social, or political goal can be adequ adequately pursued without a philosophical examination and understanding of the world in which that pursuit might occur. For this reason, Newton often began his uh, accounts of intercommunalism by laying out um, uh, how knowledge of reality might be uh, attained at all. Uh, I'll just kind of mention then, in uh, different texts, he kind of goes about it in different ways. Sometimes he contrasts empiricism, which is based off of you know, subjective observation, contrasts that with rationalism, the idea that truth can be acquired through just the application of reason, reason. Uh, looks to their, the shortcomings of each, and then he argues that Marx's um, take on dialectical materialism uh, draws from the strengths of both in order to get a better uh, account of how things in the world uh, are constituted and transformed over time. Quote, Marx, as a social scientist, criticized other social scientists for attempting to explain phenomena, or one phenomenon, so things in the world, if you will, by taking it out of its context, isolating it, putting it into a category, and not acknowledging the fact that once it was taken out of its environment, the phenomenon was transformed. So, uh, for Newton, uh, dialectical materialism gives us a sense of, helps us understand better what the world is, how it's changing, and what can be done given those changes as they're occurring. For him, dialectical materialism tells us that nothing is static, nothing is isolated, that the world is transformed through constant flux and antagonisms, and that some form of knowledge of these turning points can be acquired through a combination of observation and rational reflection. Dialectical materialism, diamat is for short, also serves as a method that makes it possible to identify how the key center of conflict in any situation may have shifted. So, uh, to that point, uh, the Black Panther Party was constantly shifting their strategy. Kind of most prominently, uh, they shifted in 1966 from black nationalism to an anti-capitalist revolutionary nationalism by 1969. So if you look at the 10-point program, in 66, they, they call for an end to the robbery by the white man over black community. By 69, though, they call for an end to the robbery by the capitalists of, of our black and oppressed communities. Uh, under Newton's conception of uh, dialectical materialism in the world, which is, um, for those any familiar at all with Mao Zedong thought, distinctly Maoist, uh, contradictions exist everywhere, but only certain ones are antagonistic contradictions. And when pushed these contradictions will, by definition, inevitably transform the whole dynamic at hand. So I'll, I'll read a bit of um, Fred Hampton, who is kind of better known for, or well known, for uh, being able to articulate a lot of these complex ideas in more kind of uh, everyday language. He says, uh, so he's chair of the, of the Illinois chapter of Black Panther Party, assassinated by the police. Did, did you ever see something and pull it and take it as far as you can, and it almost outstretches itself and goes into something else? If you take it so far that it is two things, as a matter of fact, some things, if you stretch it so far, it'll be a different thing. Did you ever cook something so long that it turns into something else? That's what we're talking about with politics. 
Politics ain't nothing, but if you stretch it so long that it can't go no further, then what you got on your hands? You got an, you got an anti- antagonistic contradiction. All right. Uh, you know, questions so far? Questions, questions. All right. Well, I, yes, yes. This goes back to while you're doing your excellent presentation. I've been thinking, you, you said two pages back here that there was a point where we were talking about um, white people with a, with a nation, but not a nation state. Uh, yeah, so um, in passing, uh, he refers to, so if nation states no longer exist, because all of the world is already basically capitalist, globalized empire. You know, uh, I mean, this is uh, not unpopular theory these days uh, among certain economists, right? That uh, transnationalism basically means that governments have less and less power, and increasingly, actually, capital, uh, the, you know, capital elite dictate things. Yeah. And so, um, what John Ryan identifies in the present, particularly with basically Trump white populist nationalism, is the rise in nationalism, the belief in our nation, even while the nation state is actually in decline. Yeah. So the capitalists can have access to the military, however they don't believe in the welfare of their society. That's what you mean by nation state, is they don't want Mm. to give handouts from their wealth, but if they want to, they can use the military to to knock down the door and force people to buy their things. Uh, I I think that's a solid understanding, or austerity is another term people use for this. Um, uh, I mean, it's also the, I mean, the question, that's the question. The military, how much can we conceive of it as tied to the nation state or the, the, the modern nation state? And how often is it tied to concretely um, the pursuits of corporations, particularly with the, the increase and rise in kind of paramil- paramilitary organizations? I think, yeah, these are questions to, to engage and kind of pull apart. Uh, all right. Uh, any other questions on this stuff? I'm going to move on to um, basically yeah, Newton's conception about what can, what's possible politically given those conditions. Uh, so revolutionary inter- intercommunalism. Quote, there's a long quote of Newton's. When the people seize the means of production, when they seize the mass media and so forth, you will still have racism, you will still have ethnocentrism, you will still have contradictions. But the fact that the people will be in control of all the productive and institutional units of society, not only factories, but the media too, will enable them to start solving these contradictions. It will produce new values, new identities. It will mold a new and essentially human culture as the people resolve old conflicts based off of cultural and economic conditions. At some point, there will be a qualitative change and the people will have transformed revolutionary intercommunalism into communism. We call it communism because at this point in history, people will not only control the productive and institutional units of society, but they will also have seized possession of their own subconscious attitudes towards these things. And for the first time in history, they will have a more rather than less conscious relationship to the material world, people, plants, books, machines, media, everything in which they live. They will have power, that is, They will control the phenomena around them and make them act in some desired manner, and they will know their own real desires. The first step in this process is the seizure by the people of their own communities. Uh, um, This unpublished text called Intercommunalism, 1974, that, yeah, like I said, Viewpoint will put out uh, soon. Uh, Yeah, so... I said the Black Panther Party started kind of as a black nationalist organization, having observed that, quote, most people in the world had, had solved their problems by forming into nations. Uh, however, they were deeply critical of African or black-led states where, that were nonetheless authoritarian or capitalist or within which black people were poor. For black liberation to really come to pass, it would require to be also against capitalism. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll read this quote. Uh, He's a better writer than I am, so. Uh, It was my life, plus independent reading, that made me a socialist, nothing else. I became convinced of the benefits of collectivism and a collectivist ideology. I also saw the link between racism and the economics of capitalism, although, despite the link, I recognized that it was necessary to separate the concepts in analyzing the general situation. In psychological terms, 
racism could continue to exist even after the economic problems that had created racism had been resolved. Never convinced that destroying capitalism would automatically destroy racism, I felt, however, that we could not destroy racism without uh, wiping out its economic foundation. It is necessary to think much more creatively and independently about these complex interconnections. That's from uh, Newton's uh, autobiography, Revolutionary Suicide. Uh, right, so then Black Panther Party shifted to revolutionary nationalism, uh, granting the need to, to transform society economically. Um, however, uh, really within a year or two of the Black Panther Party's founding, the leadership would come to the conclusion that the black community in the U.S. could not, practically speaking, become a nation state, secure with their own territory and uh, with full control over their economic, political, and cultural life um, after all. Quote, it is an endless circle, you see. To achieve nationhood, we needed to become a dominant force. But to become a dominant force, we needed to be a nation. Uh, so, more to the point, if African Americans were indeed ever able to establish a separate nation state, even if it were socialist, there would be little to stop the U.S. from uh, invading and turning, turning it into a colony in the old school sense, you know, traditional colonialism, or in the contemporary neocolonialist sense, through economic control given the reality of reactionary intercommunalism or globalization. So given that, the only solution could then be for the Black Panther Party to ally themselves with other oppressed peoples domestically and abroad. Uh, I have a bunch of writings here on um, some of Newton's um, kind of <coughs> critiques and questionings or decentering of race as a category. And I can go into that if people are interested uh, later, but I'll kind of set that aside for now. Uh, and yet, by 1970, Newton came to reject even internationalism as a flawed revolutionary strategy. The reasons for this rejection are based in at least two problems or contradictions, one external to the Black Panther Party and one internal to it. The first problem is related to Newton's understanding of the world under reactionary intercommunalism or globalization, if you will. Uh, the capitalists... Uh, yeah, no, let's skip this. Right, so if the, the world is really just a collection of communities with little actual sovereign control over themselves, um, you can't really have true internationalism because there are no more nations in the first place. Uh, quote, the people and the economy are so integrated into the imperialist empire that it's impossible to decolonize to return to the former conditions of existence. And if colonies cannot decolonize and return to their original existence as nations, then nations no longer exist. Nor, we believe, will they ever exist again. So, again, they can only exist kind of liberated territories, kind of pockets of resistance within global uh, American empire. Um, so, um, actually, already in 74, Noon is critiquing actually both the extent to which communist China can be understood as a nation state and also uh, Soviet Russia. Of communist China, he says, by whom are the Chinese, for instance, forced? They are forced by the actions of the United States. Instead of putting their money into schools, the hospitals, and into institutions in their community, they are forced to maintain a large military. So their liberated territory is very similar to what happened in the riots and rebellions in Detroit, where for about four or five days, the black uh, population there held about eight blocks, and they drove the local police and the National Guard out and the peace was not res restored. They held the territory for four days. They could have had a revolutionary provisional government, and we would have recognized it just as we recognize the People's Republic of China. We do not recognize uh, the PRC as a nation, but as a liberated territory and a community that is somewhat free, but can only maintain its freedom through a constant fight. Uh, of um, communist Russia, he says, um, in a, a text called The Technology Question, published in 1972, uh, he says that the Soviet Union had actually already become a satellite of the United States uh, when they formed the United States-Soviet Union Trade Agreement of 1972. Um, he says, Russia's first mistake came in the form of an incorrect analysis that socialism could coexist peacefully with capitalist nations. All right, so now the second problem Newton encountered uh, had to do with, again, uh, 
it was internal to the black community and the Black Panther Party. Uh, now, he expected uh, back, backlash from black elites. Uh, Rory Wilkins, um, at the time, uh, wrote a strong kind of criticism of the Black Panther Party for their, devo- their devotion of troops, or their proposed devotion of troops to, to Vietnam. Um, but he was more surprised by the backlash by um, the, ma- the mass base of the party. Quote, our, our offer of troops to the Vietnamese receives neg- negative reactions from the people, truly oppressed people. Welfare recipients wrote letters saying, I thought the party was for us. Why do you want to give those dirty Vietnamese our lifeblood? I would call this a contradiction, one we are trying to solve. We are trying to give some therapy, you might say, to our community and lift their consciousness, but first we, we have to be accepted. We try to do whatever is possible to meet the patient on the grounds that he or she can best relate to, because after all, after all they are the issue. Uh, right, so Noon's critique of internationalism was influenced by the need to address the ideological relationship of the black community to American nationalism. Uh, as Americans, uh, even for the most marginalized, poor, or even recently immigrated among, among us, uh, we are inclined to uphold the false belief in our exceptionalism and our, sometimes even our, our superiority, if not at least our social difference from the rest of the world. The vitality of, of nationalism is in part maintained by the state's dispensation, of course, of certain material privileges, citizenship, and a symbolic status uh, onto a population based off of the mere and arbitrary facts of our birth. The defensive kind of response that, well, we need to take care of our own first, serves to obscure the active role that we play in disconnecting ourselves from the suffering of the rest of the world, even when it is, in fact, deeply connected to our own suffering. Uh, so I would further suggest then that Newton was able to identify that this reactionary tendency uh, necessarily reasserts itself through the nationalism that is presumed within internationalism. Uh, yeah. Some thoughts on Afro-pessimism, and I'll set those aside. All right. So, for Newton... Yeah, well, I'll just... Well, you know, I'll just, right, I'll just say... Uh, this is brief. This is brief. So, uh, without going to what Afro-pessimism is, um, uh, I'll say, uh, yeah, a lot of theorists recently have engaged with this question of... Um, the, the unique position that Afro uh, diasporic people have been placed in under modernity, arguably one of, of uh, subjection or abjection, non, utter non personhood. Right? For these thinkers, the forced social death of diasporic Africans as a continued effect of slavery is an indispensable feature of Western society or perhaps of capitalism, depending on which theorists you're looking at. In some ways, Newton might be said to agree with the basic intuitions behind some of these views, but informed by his intercommunalist perspective, he comes to opposite conclusions. For Newton, all oppressed people within the bounds of American empire are in some sense colonized. Furthermore, though, because black people in America compose a a uniquely colonized community, comparable to colonized communities in other parts of the world, while simultaneously being located at the center of the empire, the black community is in a uniquely privileged position to destroy that empire. Specifically, Newton considered black people in the U.S. to be in the ideal position to act, act as the vanguard for the global revolution against reactionary intercommunalism. Quote, we believe that black Americans are the first real internationalists, not just the Black Panther Party, but black people who live in America. We have been internationally dispersed by slavery, and we can easily identify with other people in other cultures. Because of slavery, we never really felt attached to the nation in the same way that the peasant was attached to the soil in Russia. Uh, so according to official Black Panther Party ideology, African diasporic people in America are not a minority, but rather members of the colonized global majority, imported over centuries to build the foundational wealth in the heart of the empire. Uh, that means that uh, we, like other press groups in the U.S., reap benefits from the ex- exploitation of the rest of the world uh, while also being in a strategic position to uproot the empire at its base. Uh, not to quote Newton a bit more here. If we believe we are brother with the people of Mozambique, how can we help? They need arms and other material aid. We have no weapons to give. We have no money for materials. Then how do we help? They cannot fight for us. We cannot fight in their place. 
we can each narrow the territory that our common oppressor occupies. We can liberate ourselves, learning from and teaching each other along the way, but the struggle is the same, the enemy is the same. So, within a reactionary intercommunalist world, intercommunal solidarity and revolutionary struggle is to fight locally for one's own freedom, as well as to fight locally for the freedom of those far away. Intercommunalism is therefore uh, Newton's, if you will, kind of non-statist theoretical frame, uh, a frame that critiques border ideology at its base. Uh, all right, how about we um, take a little break, you know, whatever, stretch, bathroom, and all that, uh, and then I'll go into how the Black Panther Party applied this theory, yeah, it w which will be briefer than what, what I've spoken about so far. Yeah. I know that, you know, practically speaking, no one can really listen for more than like 40 minutes at a time. And so. Is it the viewpoint publication going to be a physical publication? Oh, no, no. Yeah, online. Online. He was assassinated in 68. Um, I mean, his assassination caused the, the party to expand immensely, right? Because it was sort of seen as like, oh, the pro-peace guy got assassinated. That tells us that militarism is the way to go, you know? Um, he would have occasional, like, as I understand it, I, I don't know like a lot of MLK's writing very well, but I know that he would make references to black militants that the support armed uh, struggle. Um, you know, critically, typically. Though, I think more, one of the more interesting overlaps between MLK and the Panthers is that really late in his life, he definitely um, agreed with their analysis as well as the James and um, Grace Lee Boggs' analysis of um, automation um, and the replacement of jobs. Um, 
by technology, particularly you know, uh, among black folks, hired, uh, hired last, fired first kind of thing. Um, uh, but yeah, yeah. Wasn't there an incident where Kane met with a bunch of people in Chicago who were maybe gang With the Blackstone Rangers. Yeah, actually, they served as um, uh, security for them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Black Sun Rangers, they're they're, they're um, interesting because uh, right, right. So yeah, Fred Hampton did develop an alliance with the Young Lords that had been a gang, and then you know became leftist. Um, and he like definitely reached out to various gangs. The Black Sun Rangers were a lot bigger than the the Black Panther Party. So when Hampton offered them the opportunity to to join the Panthers, they said no thanks, but you can join us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the, their leader Jeff Fort was a pretty savvy guy. So he's currently in um, Supermax uh, prison in Colorado, Florence ADX. But he would um, get like letters or hearsay that the Panthers wanted to kill him or whatever. That was just FBI in, in, informants and stuff. But he was smart to it and didn't in, in, uh, engage with the Panthers antagonistically. Yeah. Um, though actually, the Panthers often refused to be hired as security for um, uh, the events of other kind of groups because they didn't want to be seen as just like, uh, yeah, muscle men, if you will. You know, yeah, yeah. Though er really early on, they did kind of help. Um, uh, what's the word? Uh, not liaison. What's the word? Basically, uh, like help protect and guide around Betty Shabazz. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Malcolm X's uh, widow at the time, uh, when she took a visit to the Bay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. All right. Uh, yeah, any questions about anything so far? Um, mm -hmm. uh, the way that Newton talks about it, it was because it, it just didn't make sense to people. I thought the Black, Black Panther Party was about black people. Why do we care about Vietnamese? And the thought then being that that's grounded in basically an American exceptionalism, an American nationalism. Even while the person, you know, he talks about like a welfare recipient writing this letter, you know? Um, and I mean, that, that is the case. The very poor, very poor Americans do nonetheless T uh, tend to believe in their exceptionalism relative to other people. Yeah. So how does he define community? I mean, so I get it's a subnational, but it's mm. there's reactionary forms of communities under empire. Yeah. And yep. yet it's a revolutionary unit. I mean, maybe this is you don't have to say something about his century race, but is community then a sort of essentialized, naturalized mm. of community in his? Yeah. Um, I'll speak to a lot more of that in the section that follows. Yeah, and then we'll engage with those questions. And I, I have some thoughts about that, too. Um, yeah. Uh, any other questions? All right. Uh, so by, by 1970, the federal government and many state and municipal governments had already escalated the harassment of the Black Panther Party to the level of open war, assassinations, SWAT, uh, you know, it was developed uh, against the LA Panthers, undercover operatives, psychological warfare, etc. Um, now, so the, the the party started in the mix, mid '60s, and this is 1970. Uh, typically, people then think of then the party kind of ending at that point, but really, the Black Panther Party, whether we're talking about the Oakland-based, uh, what later would become a commune, or talking about the guerrilla warfare strategies employed on the East Coast and the Midwest, parts of the South, those continued into 1982. Um, and a lot of that history is not really um, engaged with or analyzed at all. Uh, right, so for what has come to be called the Newton faction, or the West Coast faction, uh, there was a sharp strategic turn away from openly violent political uh, struggle with the state, and a shift instead towards the development of 
institutionally autonomous uh, social service programs. Um, what many now, uh, have come to basically dismiss on the part of the Panthers as reformism. Um, uh, Noon himself says, a 10-point program is not revolutionary in itself, nor is it reformist. It is a survival program. We the people are threatened with genocide because racism, racism and fascism are rape, rampant in this country and throughout the world. Um, I, I would suggest then that Newton's analysis of conditions at the time led him and the party towards a renewed focus on uh, what many Marxists call social reproduction as a primary terrain of political struggle, shifting to a strategy oriented towards developing local autonomous organs of power tied to land, um, that is, you know, specifically the severe poverty of black people made it clear that merely sustaining the black community, black persons, uh, while working simultaneously to establish uh, institutions that would allow for a separation from capitalism was a political struggle in itself. Uh, the very survival of black people was a political question. Uh, right, so then, uh, whereas early in the party, they employed serve the people programs, specifically the breakfast program, which is well known. Uh, they later then start, stopped using that phrase and instead used the phrase survival program to refer to expansions of the breakfast program, but also um, you know, the uh, health clinics that were established. Uh, uh, the, let's see. Sorry. Uh, rather, sorry. Rather than survival program, survival pending revolution. That was the motto. Uh, Sorry, I'll get to this in a bit. I have to circle back in a moment. Apologies. All right, so the Black Panther Party from the beginning was heavily influenced by Frantz Fanon, right, who emphasized that it's ra rather than the, the working class, that it's rather the unemployed, underemployed, criminal classes that would most likely bring about revolution. Uh, the thought being that the working class is actually too tied to uh, the, the workings of capitalism to be, to be willing to give it up. Uh, this is... Uh, the thought then was actually that this population, the lump and proletariat, uh, would inevitably expand over time uh, because of automation, the replacement of jobs with technology, um, and the increasing vitality of imperialism generally. Uh, right. So then uh, Marxists used some, the term surplus populations in part to engage with some of these ideas. Um, now, to be part of a surplus population under capitalism is to be allowed or even actively made to perish. This has always gone hand in hand with racialization and dehumanization. And as uh, the Black Panther Party pointed out, and, and also James and Grace Lee Boggs, black workers um, have typically been the last hired and the first fired you know, when it comes to, to jobs. And so they've long been well acquainted with the psychological feel, feeling of abandonment and the material exposure to death that large portions of the 20th century white working class or maybe only more recently come, uh, being forced to confront and responding to with reaction, uh, kind of reactionary politics. Um, right, so Noon's theory of intercommunalism is grounded in the question of what is to happen to a proletariat working class that is increasingly no longer useful to capitalism as workers and is likely to be eventually, quote, transformed out of existence. Noon argues that these kinds of conditions make it necessary if we are to survive to come up with a different conception of ourselves. Quote, Today's capitalist has developed machinery to such a point that he can hire a group of specialized people called technocrats. In the near future, he will certainly do more of this, and the technocrat will be too specialized to be identified as a proletarian. In fact, that group of technocrats will be so vital that we will have to, come, we'll have to do something to explain the, presence of, the mere presence of other people. We'll have to come up with another definition and reason for existing. For Newton, no longer can the class-conscious worker with a waged relationship to production be assumed to be the central actor in a revolutionary narrative, which um, perhaps was a tenuous claim in the first place. Wherever else one might gain access to the means to consumption, with or without the wage, is the primary site of struggle. Um, now, the, the specter of black genocide has been a question on the black left for a long time, uh, before it was taken up by, say, the rest of the left, um, I mean, Malcolm X submitted a, a petition to the UN accusing the US of genocide. Civil Rights Congress, a group of black communists in the 50s did. Uh, George Jackson wrote extensively about uh, black genocide as a question. Um, can get into some of that 
I, I, I can get into some of that later if we, if we want. Um, all that said, Newton was particularly concerned with the more daily and normalized uh, instances of genocide. He wrote at length, for example, about black children of the South who, merely for lack of shoes, are regularly exposed to parasites that hinder cognitive development, which is actually still a problem. There was like a, a New Yorker article, I think, or Times article about this just like a few years ago. All right, so if we consider one of Newton's most um, kind of Mao-influenced uh, maxims, war is politics without bloodshed, politics is war without bloodshed, then we can understand how the matters of, of everyday health, social organization, and governance are indeed matters of life and death, and ergo, political struggle. Newton wanted the Black Panther Party to, quote, put up obstacles against an annihilation on a local level by contending politically over uh, the control of resources, territory, commodity flows, and popular legitimacy. Yeah. His quote, or my part? Yeah. The, um, the Black Newton wanted the Black Panther Party to contend politically over control of resources, territory, commodity flows, and popular legitimacy. So for that reason, then, uh, the Black Panther Party t turned their, their Oakland chapter into a commune um, as a kind of bulwark against capitalist control. Um, so in 71, uh, the Central Committee of the Black Panther Party started closing by force regional Black Panther Party uh, chapters na na nationwide. They would uh, sometimes take the, like the best recruiters um, and organizers from those other chapters and um, bring them to Oakland while simultaneously kind of kicking out various um, more militant, guerrilla-oriented uh, comrades in other places. Um, and yeah, like I said, they kind of expanded their social service-oriented programs. Um, so developing more medical clinics, free clothing programs, more free food distributions, and opening several, several schools. Uh, less well-known, the Black Panther Party also consolidated control over 21 properties, mostly in the Bay Area, Develop, developed plans to operate their own factories, and also made an extensive effort to take control of the port of Oakland, which at the time was the second largest port in the world in terms of container tonnage. They also began, began re-engaging with institutions that, had previous, that they had previously rejected altogether, such as black businesses and black churches. Now, these new strategies were informed by Newton's dialectical materialist logic, according to which the party analyzed the conditions of the time and sought to reassess who might be friend or foe by pushing at the population in question until they were forced to choose sides through their actions. So, basically, the Black Panther Party leveraged the black identity of black business owners to get resources for the party, uh, often in the form of a regula regu regularized tribute. Um, first, they would do this by kind of insisting on their support, by appealing to black solidarity, and then if that didn't work, they would organize bo boycotts against the black businesses to exert economic pressure. And if that failed, then they would uh, extort the businesses by threats or violent means. Any businesses uh, that refused to consent until they either gave in to Black Panther Party demands or revealed themselves to be enemies of the people. Uh, the Black Panther Party aimed to leverage these relationships with capitalists while nonetheless maintaining that ultimately, quote, there is no salvation in capitalism. Newton's position was that under reactionary intercommunalism, relative to the dominant power of elite global capitalists, the black bourgeoisie is in fact mostly powerless. A fantasy, quote, a fantasy bourgeoisie, and this is true of most of the white bourgeoisie too. And so that means that they can be recruited or made use of accordingly. All right. Um, so yeah, so then in 74, all right, so then they, they formed this commune and uh, immediately the, con the commune starts looking like communes t tend to look. Uh, very small, uh, a lot of internal um, coerciveness, uh, so I'll kind of go into that. Um, by 74, after some electoral campaigns um, that they engaged in failed, uh, party membership contracted to about 150 to 100 members, so again, talking about Oakland, um, not including students enrolled in the schools, uh, and the party form had been, at that point, clearly reshaped altogether. Concerning the communal life of the Black Panther Party, Newton stated, and this is from his autobiography also, again, Revolutionary Suicide, the closeness of the group and the shared sense of purpose transform us into a harmonious, functioning body, working for the destruction of those conditions that make people suffer. 
Our unity has transformed us to the point where we have not compromised with the system. We have the closeness and love of family life, the will to live in spite of cruel conditions. Consciousness is the first step toward control of a situation. We feel free as a group. We know what troubles us, and we act. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so for all its strengths, the, uh, the weaknesses of the, like I said, of the Oakland chapter mirrored other kind of typical 20th century leftist communes. Members were required, required to engage in regular self-criticism and re-education, in, again, in this Maoist style, to attend the party's son of man temple, to meet work quotas, and the liberation school featured mandatory communal dorming for all students. Particularly sexist polygamy uh, and gendered violence uh, was not uncommon, and physical violence of all sorts was often used to create internal discipline. Uh, and there's a lot more I can say about that stuff, and when I publish this, I'll kind of go into those details a bit more. Um, but uh, in any case, already by 1971, though, Newton had grown increasingly paranoid, and this was exacerbated by the effects of solitary confinement uh, on him, and also the finely calibrated psychological harassment of him by the FBI, uh, and so with kind of a resultant political authoritarianism, uh, the, yeah, the party as a whole kind of reflected that dynamic. Now, uh, though the decline in Newton's health would become clearer and more evident later, um, I would say that it's not presumptuous to suggest that Newton's mental state likely influenced the party's policy decision to basically purge the party, close all these chapters, uh, etc. in 72. Now, uh, despite uh, what's I mean, evidently uh, Newton's extraordinary commitment to theoretical consistency, I would argue that, in some ways, Newton failed actually to apply his own theory of intercommunalism to its full logical conclusion. As uh, party members and allies nationwide increasingly suffered assassinations and military attacks at the hands of the state, the Central Committee and Newton came to the, to the conclusion that the movement had overextended itself and had started above-ground military operations too early. For this reason, among others, the Oakland chapter, again, contracted the national chapters, um, Right. Uh, however, it is important to understand that actually few Panther chapters were, strictly speaking, simply offspring of the Oakland chapter. Many Panther chapters were autonomously run with little material support from Oakland. Some had historically actually preceded the, Panther, the Panthers themselves and had simply taken on the Panther name and symbols while pursuing their own local goals originally. Some organizations shared political affinities or sold the Black Panther Party paper, but did not actually explicitly join the party. And one chapter, New York City's, was um, actually had, was much larger than Oakland's. Uh, another chapter, uh, Baltimore's, was actually founded by federal agents. So, uh, now, uh, now, so, so if one conceives of these organizations not as chapters of one national organization, but as distinct local movements seeking to become liberated territories against, uh, against reactionary intercommunalism, then for the Oakland chapter to insist on authority over all of these disparate organizations, that would be akin to the, the Panthers insisting on authority over the National Liberation Front of South Vietnam, uh, with whom they had expressed solidarity in, in 1970. The underground conditions in the Midwest were distinct from those in Oakland, which were further distinct from those in New York City. And presumably, they would all have had, uh, had to engage in different and differentiated strategies and tactics, given conditions on the ground. So one might uh, charge, then, that by asserting authority over all national chapters, Newton was falling to the very belief in the bounds and borders of the nation-state that he had actually intended to fundamentally criticized through his theory of intercommunalism. Uh, yeah, I can say more about that, but let me try to wrap up um, by trying to speak to a bit of uh, contemporary conditions and what we can draw from Newton for, for the present. Um, <clears throat> yeah. While Newton's currently available writings on intercommunalism are in many places regret regret ugh, regret regrettably sparse or even underdeveloped, the portions of his theory that we have access to have much to offer those of us thinking about contemporary struggles for liberation. For one, Newton's insistence on strategizing beyond the nation state 
in a way different from that of the older generation of internationalists, should resonate for those today struggling with the limitations and problems of pursuing democratic socialism within the bounds of a nation state. Newton might urge us to reconsider whether organizations or movements based in, say, San Diego might be able to develop more productive solidarities with organizations based in, say, Tijuana than with ones in New York City. While San Diego and New York City might share, like, maybe political beliefs or political ideology, or even some material limitations imposed by federal law, other dynamics such as economic flows, community composition, major language, uh, might be more significant for determining political possibility and whether or not two organizations um, can uh, collaborate. And that might be more important than, again, the question of whether or not they're in, on the same side of a legal border. Uh, Newton's theory might also help us make more sense of the kinds of non-statist and proto-statist political movements that have arisen and somehow have persisted in recent decades. Um, well, some things that come to mind are the Zapatistas in Mexico, Kurdish Rojava, right, movements that... Uh, haven't intended to take state power, but rather just kind of maintain autonomous control over territory. Um, another U.S.-based um, project is the Jackson Cush Plan, or also known as the uh, Corporation Jackson, based out of Mississippi, and with similar approaches. Um, a conscious shift toward the pursuit of a kind of politics of autonomy within or across nation states can also be identified, though across the political spectrum. Kind of to your the point of uh, your question earlier from transnational gangs to Hezbollah, ISIS, Michoacan. Yeah. Um, now, while material practices or forms of life, uh, I guess to quote Takun there a bit, may indeed be the only practical grounds for radical solidarity under, global, un under current global conditions, the conjoined matters of mass politics and class consciousness remain a question. The question of how people might be motivated to pursue revolution and how ideas might circulate under reactionary intercommunalism did not escape Newton, of course, though. Uh, Elaine Brown points out that uh, though he did not live long enough to know of the internet, Huey argued that as technology was bringing the world ever closer together, the world's people were poised to recognize their common oppressor and unite around their common oppression. Uh, so... Uh, uh, David Kilcullen, who uh, was a senior counterinsurgency advisor to General Petraeus and to uh, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice under Bush, uh, identifies information itself as a soft target that non-state actors can exploit in a contemporary world where war, crime, and the politics of resistance become increasingly blurred and transnational. Uh, Kilcullen notes how otherwise improbable solidarities developed in... Um, through social media during the Tunisian revolution uh, between sports hooligans and radical leftist hackers uh, uh, helping to establish and spread the forms of political consciousness that brought basically people to the streets, riots, and violent clashes against the state. Uh, this is to say nothing of the use of the digital terrain to struggle over resources and currency itself. Uh, in the 1960s, the counterintuitive uh, uh, solidarities that the Black Panther Party fostered between black religious communities, unemployed street youth, Vietnam veterans, white college students, and Hollywood celebrities even, irked many on the left that insisted on a more limited conception of what properly constitutes a class. For Newton, in accordance with dialectical materialism, classes arise and disappear in history as an effect of material conditions of exploitation and oppression and as antagonistic contradictions divide and redivide the population in new ways. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry for stumbling and stuff a bunch. All right. Uh, questions? Discussion? Whatever. Oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah, um, he, in this particular text that I was drawing from a lot, he makes reference to communism and anarchy. I'll just read those two lines. Uh, the logic of the thesis of intercommunalism is, colon, imperialism leads to reactionary intercommunalism, to revolutionary intercommunalism, to pure communism and anarchy. Each of the concepts is in need of definition and redefinition. 
And then he also kind of uh, more or less ends the text by saying, revolutionary intercommunalism and the good anarchy that Marx spies afar off at the end of history are worldly of this world. I, I think uh, because he says that you, you could imagine something like communism and still, having, still have racism, ethnocentrism, etc., I think then the thought is that there would be some other form of social organization within which um, those forms of hierarchy and oppression no longer exist. So I think then he's kind of using this term kind of specul- speculatively. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's it, yeah. You mentioned, you, uh, you want to talk about uh, later uh, unions and the idea of race? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, so... Uh, what, what was your question? Yeah, um, I was curious, the, the trajectory that he outlined from uh, reactionary communalism down to communism and anarchy, um, it sounds not unlike the three orthodox Marxist capitalism, socialism, communism. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. Is, is, it, is he just sort of recreating that or reframing it, or are there important differences? Mm. Um, there is one. And this, like, bad, I'll answer your question in a moment. Uh, it's, it's, it takes more sense of treatment. Um, in this kind of batch of writings that I came across, there's some that is clearly uh, like very drafty, you know, where he's written things, then edited it on typewriter, and then edited it with um, handwriting. And so I try to draw from those a bit less, right? Um, but in one of those, that that's this one text is started explicitly as um, he says something like. Uh, you know, the Black Panther Party has declared themselves uh, revolutionary intercommunalists. Revolutionary intercommunalism is a logical and rational extension of Marxist-Leninist theory. You know, like he says, basically what you just said. Yeah, so that, but then he decided not to finish that or put it out for the party. So, um, and the question is, who would be the targeted audience for that text? Would it be the non-black left? You know, the CPUSA with whom the Panthers rarely had a good relationship anyways. Um, yeah. Yeah, I can say more, I guess, but the rest would be speculative. You know, that's what he said. Now, in regards to, to race, um, uh, so, I mean, I, I would say that Huey Newton, uh, throughout his writings, often kind of reflects, uh, yeah, th- I mean, this is my, my interpretation, an awareness of the social or political constructedness of of race and blackness as a category. In, in one um, passage, he says, I knew the difference between white people and black people, of course, but the cue was always the way white people treated us, not the color itself. And then he kind of goes on to account, to tell a story about a particular uh, person who tried to join the Black Panther Party that said that she was black, but people said, no, you're not black, you're clearly white. And... Um, his kind of attempt to like analyze this and other instances where uh, race as a category became blurred, and the question of like where to, you know where to assign solidarity would kind of come up. Um, but of course, it was clear that Newton also considered the category a necessary one for recognizing certain material dynamics, right? Like the racialized character of colonization, lumpenization, etc., uh, and also its usefulness for establishing pol- political and uh, political solidarity like in the later years of the party, like I suggested, with black businesses. Uh, that said, ult- Newton did ultimately say, uh, consider it politically necessary to eventually establish a universal identity that was disconnected from cultural, racial, and religious chauvinism. Um, kind of perhaps in the most kind of provocative uh, form that he suggests, he says at some point um, that when the job of the Black Panther Party is done, the Black Panther Party will no longer be the black underlined Panther Party. Uh, yeah, and then, I mean, there are other things in there where he talks about colonization, right? Obviously, central to the Black Panther Party's ideology is that, again, black people are a colonized minority of the majority. Um, though kind of following from his theory of internationalism, he, at different points he also talks about other populations in the U.S. being colonized. Um, 
I mean, obviously he talks about indigenous people as colonized. He talks about uh, whites at the the start of the country being a colonized population. So you know, before the revolutionary, before the American Revolution, um, being uh, uh, sorry. Um, so right, a lot of the people that came over from Europe were criminalized class, were indentured servants, second borns, outcasts, and all this. And he talks about, let me see if I can pull up this quote, actually. Again, he tends to put things a lot better than, than I could. Um, one second. Sorry, sorry. Control find. Where's it? Oh. <laughs> it's like in a footnote. All right. Let me see if I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how it works. Okay, yeah. It says, um, in a text called, um, On the Peace Movement, so he's talking about kind of uh, basically white hippies, right? The anti-war movement. At one time, at one time, I thought that only blacks were colonized. I thought we have, I think, but I think we have to change our rhetoric to an extent because the whole American people have been colonized if you consider exploitation as a colonized effect. 76 companies have exploited everyone. American people are a colonized people even more so than the people in developing countries where the military operates. Um, in regards to European immigrants, uh, you know, the, the early beginning of the kind of American colonization, he says, now these same colonized white people, these bondsmen, paupers, and thieves, deny the colonized black man, man not only the right to abolish his, this oppressive system, but even to speak of abolishing it. So, right, just because one is colonized doesn't mean that one can still oppress others. Um, and uh, there's some more here. Oh, yeah, I mean, I mean, really kind of throughout the 60s, at various points, black leftists use the word black sometimes in more capacious or kind of stretched out senses. So, um, Malcolm X talks about, um, it, in the message to the grassroots, he says, of, he says about the, concerning the white man, he says, he knows that the black revolution is worldwide in scope and in nature. The black revolution is sweeping Asia, sweeping Africa, is rearing it, its head in Latin America. Right? And then also uh, James uh, and Grace Lee Boggs um, in uh, The City is the Black Man's Land say... Uh, like in a footnote, they say, well, when, when we say black, actually we mean all people of color uh, who are engaged in revolutionary struggle in the United States and all over the world, right? So uh, um, a lot of people have, have, like, engaged with this question and kind of tried to stretch a category and reconceive it, you know? Um, uh, but that doesn't mean that the category doesn't have political and practical use, right? Which is why Newton insisted on it. And really what he said, actually... Um, the, one of the ways that he cr criticized the kind of quick rush to militarism on the part of the rest of the national chapters was by saying that the Black Panther Party had, oh, what, there's a text called The Defection of Eldridge Cleaver from the Black Panther Party and The Defection of the Black Panther Party from the Black Community, right? And so this was part of the inspiration behind going back to this kind of local struggle. And um, the, Noon's concern was that they had kind of moved too quickly to ally themselves with basically kind of popular popular leftism, you know? Like, Cleaver was very um, kind of happy to organize with, like, white celebrities often to the detriment of kind of organizing uh, the mass base. And so Newton criticized this and, again, urged the return back to the black community. Now, you can have that analysis and still think about race as a social political uh, construct. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, that's, that's a lot of things. Other questions? Uh, this yeah. is the same question in different guys, but just uh, you, you mentioned this on Hyder's book, the critique of the uh, Black, Black Panther Party. I was wondering if you could speak to that at all, like what, what, your, what your take is on that. 
Which book? Oh, 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 oh. Oh, no, no. What I mentioned was, um, so uh, when the Black Panther movie came out, Assad wrote a little kind of uh, review, critique of it. It didn't circulate much, but then we were going to kind of put it back out with this material. Um, kind of, you know, catch on the Black Panther movie wave and, you know, have all this stuff circulate. Um, I mean, you can read that. Um, I mean, in terms, uh, yeah. That's, again, Assad is better writer than I am also. Um, but, I mean, f- something funny about a movie in which um, uh, a person from Oakland who's interested in I- international revolution by arming black people globally is the bad guy, and a monarch, a monarch allied with the CIA is a good guy. I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah, at the end of the movie, he becomes a black Bill Gates because he opens up the Bill Gates Foundation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, let's say, um, I'm often wary of these kinds of conversations. I mean, it's often the case that uh, uh, see, white, white, white radicals want to be kind of quick to um, embrace critiques of the notion of race um, from people of color um, while overlooking all the other steps, like the emphasis on black genocide, right? So uh, it's worth, worth uh, kind of reemphasizing this, right? And right for Newton, a dialectical process, right? Uh, oh, you had a question. Yeah, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I, there was a point at which, when you started talking about like um, Oakland and West Coast chapter shift to um, like the, the idea of the commune and stuff, and, and how that's often been. I think you mentioned something like it's often been dismissed as like a people's term. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, I guess I'm still not clear why. I, I, I'm not necessarily the, the survival and being revolution program as reformers. Like, I, I don't know if that's like yeah. useful to, to, to decline. You know, but the electoral but program. The turn towards electoral. like electoral politics. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is pretty clearly reformist. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Right. So I think as late as like 72 or even 73, Newton explicitly says the Black Panther Party will never run political candidates for office. Um, Now, actually, technically, at that point, that was already not true, because in 68, the Panthers ran Cleaver for president through the what's the party called? Oh, man, I forget. Um, Shoot, maybe someone around time remembers. Uh, Pull this up. Uh, They ran... Uh, Cleaver on a ticket with um, this other uh, kind of white radical at the time. But that was clearly symbolic anyways. It was more about to try to bring attention to the, the party. Um, uh, now when they did run like actual um, an actual electoral campaign so Bobby Seale for mayor of Oakland and Elaine Brown as a councilwoman and then later she ran again a few different other instances. There were also a lot of um, other party members that ran for like community school board positions and this kind of thing, you know? Um, the thought there was still kind of this extension of um, gaining control of, over local territory or maybe using the, the city government to dispense funds into the party. So um, that's been an explicit aim of, um, again, the Jackson Cush plan, those folks, right? Um, uh, he also says, though, about running the can- candidates in order to get the, the Panthers more political legitimacy, um, which, yeah, I mean, to be honest, my thoughts on it are unclear. Okay. If I had to pick a side, I would say, actually, I think the electoral campaigns really are a little set aside relative to the other programs. Um, but I think most important in this is that really people haven't analyzed this material and time period very well at all. Um, and so that assessment analysis remains to be done by folks with also more kind of historical chops than, than I have in terms of like seeing exactly how the Panthers were talking about it then. Um, yeah, and that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, 
saw a hand over here somewhere. Um, I was just, you know, I can't really remember the timeline, but did, did you write anything about Angela Davis in their relationship? I mean, you're saying, you know, the, you know, they didn't have a very good relationship with the CPUSA, but she did. <laughs> right, right, yeah, so um, the, uh, I mean, uh, a lot of people think that Angela uh, Davis was in the party. Um, she was very briefly, but very quickly left. Um, at a, when she joined, the party was still mostly like lumpen teenage boys, big on the militarism stuff, and then after 68, became more uh, woman-dominated and older. So when she encountered it, she quickly identified uh, like uh, machismo, if you will, in the party, so it kind of left. She was... A, Um, she wasn't asked to leave the Panthers. Oh. I know that she was part of the, the Che La Mumba Club in CPUSA. Um, I actually don't know much about her relationship to CPUSA. Uh, um, but yeah, I mean, I would say actually her most prominent relationship with the party had to do with her relationship to George Jackson. And George Jackson, you know, uh, organized within prisons and was a field marshal, you know, yeah. So she wasn't on Newton's radar in anything you I mean... Uh, in like speeches, they would call for you know the liberation, freedom for all political prisoners, and she would be included in that list. Um, but, uh, uh, but not he read. Yeah, not I mean, he he, he he read her material. Yeah, but I mean, what what are you like looking to um, assess specifically? Did he ever write about her as an intellectual? Mm, not that I know of. You know, I mean, it, it, there's so much. This is such a rich vein of uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. stuff. I only want to say first, could you give us a reading list of what you, what you think? I, I, no, no, but I'll, sure. I'll, I'll skip that for a moment. We'll talk about that privately. But, uh, you, this notion of uh, Huey Newton as an educational theorist, underappreciated. We always hear about Malcolm educating himself in prison. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of free schools that started in the 60s, like in New York. In 67, there was a school that uh, uh, Chomsky and Angela Davis taught downtown that broke up a year later because it was started by someone who was a Shackmanite who tried to take it over. And but like, all the stuff in it was instrumental. It was about the war in Vietnam. It was filling in the background of the complex oh. now. What's fascinating about Newton, as, as I gather, and yeah. I think you mentioned that he wanted people to learn mathematics as well as politics and so forth, literally, uh, you know, there's this, there's this thing that links him uh, back to Plato and to this notion of kind of autonomous education. Um, yeah. Am I right in thinking that, or is... Uh... Uh, yeah, I mean, so we can talk about Newton as an individual and himself and how he came to his relationship to education and then how the, the party approached it. And so, sure, there, there was the ideological institute that they formed that had that aim, and then there was the liberation schools that had a slightly different orientation, more connected to the commune. Um, uh, I, I think in many regards, the Panthers' emphasis on education came out of uh, cultural nationalism. Uh, now, cultural nationalism is uh, very often dismissed um, by the Marxist left these days, but for the Black Panther Party, it was very evident that uh, racism has these psychological, ideological dimensions. They make people feel uh, like they're worthless. And the first step, before you even get to black nationalism, is that people have a sense that they are a person that can even be a part of a nation, right? That they are worthwhile. And so the Panthers made learning about, you know, uh, reading uh, Nkrumah and uh, Malcolm and uh, um, Du Bois and uh, Wright and all these people necessary or re required for membership. Um, Newton himself, uh, I mean, clearly an autodidact, um, he... Uh, like I said, learned to read late, and then, but then once he did learn to read, he devoured um, literature. Uh, Mumia actually has um, a talk, or kind of a speech, I guess, recorded talk he gave that you can find on YouTube, where he talks about what it's like for people that are prior illiterate and have, that have had to actually navigate through the world without knowing how to read, and that basically learn to ma manage things by memorizing everything what it means for a person to then become literate and suddenly have massive uh, portions of their like, intellectual capabilities freed up. 
and that often there's like a, then a big jump. Mumia posits um, in people's uh, ability to then like take in any number of things. So actually, I'll just um, read uh, a long list of the things that Newton, in his autobiography and a couple other texts, says that he read um, uh, soon after Plato. Uh, Aristotle, Descartes, David Hume, Locke, Kierkegaard, Marx, Bakunin, Dostoevsky, Nietzsche, Joyce, James Joyce, Lenin, Mao, Ho Chi Minh, Martin Delaney, Frantz Fanon, Robert Williams, Malcolm X, Durkheim, Du Bois, Pavlov, John Watson, B.F. Skinner, Herbert Hendon, Eric C. Lincoln, A.J. Ayers, Bertrand Russell, uh, the Bible, Shakespeare, Edgar Allan Poe, Victor Hugo, Franz Kafka, Albert Camus, uh, Sartre, T.S. Eliot, Ralph Ellison, Richard Wright, Langston Hughes, Claude Brown, James Baldwin, Julian Bond, Angela Davis, etc. <laughs> yeah. Nobody's talking about me. Yeah. My theory is that everybody in America is an autodidact, but few people talk to it. Oh, because our education system is so bad? Maybe. Yeah. Uh, question. So, uh, the Oakland commune, uh, how long did that commune and the other commune, it, it is very interesting to me, uh, how long did they last? When did they finally uh, expire? 81, 82. So, th- so they lasted for two years? Oh, from like... 74 to... I mean, I really... I mean, yeah, you could say 74 to 82, 73 to 82. Okay. So they lasted about roughly uh, eight, roughly some of them eight years. Yeah, I mean, and really, a lot of it was kind of centered around the school, the liberation school. Yeah, um, so the question I have is, to what extent did the, out- the external state, the police, for example, were allowed to get go into the commune? Were they allowed to? Do, did they mm. prevent the police from getting in? Did they pull, prevent other? Uh, you know, was it a, was it wall? Was it uh, oh, like a walled uh, commune? Wall, but was it was it uh, uh, like for example, Occupy? There's a, there, when Occupy took place, 2011, et cetera. Uh, you know, it, the problem was that there was uh, an ability for the state. To just wipe it out, all in within two weeks, it all got wiped out. And so I'm, I'm wondering, like, to what extent was it integrated into the rest of the community, and to mm. what extent was it? Why wasn't it all wiped out by the police? Sure. All right. So first, I'll say I'm not really in a position to answer these questions very well. Um, my research is only. I, I work on. Uh, the Black Liberation Army. I just taught a class on the Panthers, and then decided to dive in, into some of this stuff because. Um, uh, I came across these archival texts and decided, oh, looks, I, should, I should put this out because people haven't read it. Um, in regards to the commune, I would suggest looking at uh, Elaine Brown's um, autobiography, A Taste of Power. Um, I would suggest uh, Kieran Garcha, uh, who's a colleague of mine. She works in the liberation schools, and she wrote an article on the, the Black Panther commune and Panther Pat, I'll put up her name, um, uh, for Viewpoint. Elaine Brown's book. Uh, and my colleague Kieran Garcha. She wrote an article for Viewpoint on the Panthers co- communes. Uh, also, Robin Spencer, who has an excellent book on the late, pa- late party called uh, Revolutionary, The Revolution Has Come. Uh, she has, well, that text is great for all the stuff on the commune. And also, she has another article where she also makes this art argument about the Panthers as a commune. Um, uh, so, so, yeah. So, yeah, I'll just say that. Um, yeah. Maybe take one more question and then we have to break down the room and get over here by Grace Lee Right on. Yeah, so it's a question Oh, yeah. Whether it's revolutionary or not. I mean, Marx thought of it, it was the occasion for electoral politics was very important. Uh, Lenin and Trotsky did it. I mean, it depends what's what's happening in the world. We're talking historically, materially, dialectically. You know, it's not it's not just yes or no. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.